All right, well, good morning, church. Um, as Rob's introduced me, my name is Jesse. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Eastside. We are kickstarting a new series this morning, which is all on John chapter 4, which is our vision passage that we are heading into for 2024. It's, it's going to be a five-week series, and I'm dealing with one of the first topics. You can see the topics if you look on your chair. You'll find this white piece of paper. The topics are right there. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, Rian sat with us in our pastor's meeting, as he does, and he said, guys, I really feel like there's a strong sense from the Lord that we need to start having a ministry in Hatfield again. Now, as you can see, I'm obviously, I'm representing Hatfield. I've got my Hatfield shirt on. Um, shirts are for sale, 500 rand. That was a joke. But Rian said that we need to have a ministry in Hatfield, um, and at that stage, we, we love the idea, right? We sat in pastor's meeting, and he was like, I really feel like this is where God is leading us. And so as pastors, I mean, that's great news. Like, God is leading our church. It's a new opportunity for ministry. This is a possibility for more people to come to know Jesus. And so Rian had said this to us, and we were like, okay, cool, well, we need to get started. We need to do this. We need to start thinking about things differently. But the challenge was we had absolutely no ministry in Hatfield whatsoever. We had nothing there. There used to be a, a, a student ministry or a Hatfield ministry of Eastside a, a good couple of years ago, but at this stage, when Rian brought this before us, we were like, we have nothing in Hatfield. But we knew that this was something that God wanted us to get started with. And so we, we, we thought to ourselves, well, where is it that you start with something like this? When you're thinking about launching a ministry, like where is a good place to start? Because we didn't have the capacity or the time or the energy with what we were already doing to launch an entire new church. I mean, you need venues, you need money, you need branding, you need like word of mouth, you need stuff to go out on social media, you need people that are on fire for the vision. And we had me and Jason. And so we were like, well, what, what is it that we can do in Hatfield to actually get something started? Because we know that we feel that God is leading us into this direction. And so Jason actually gave a really good idea, and he said, well, why don't we just run an uh, alpha course in Hatfield? It's simple. The course is, the course is uh, 11 to 12 weeks, depending on how you set it up, and everything is kind of put together. You just need to get the branding printed. You just need to get the word out there, and you can invite people, and they can come. And so we decided that we would run a Hatfield course in Hatfield because this is what we felt like God was calling us to. And so we did it. We set a date. We ended up finding a venue, and we asked a lot more from the young adult life group that we had at that stage. Eastside had a young adult life group, which were, some of them were students, some of them were working, but almost all of them did not have any connection to Tux. They were either studying at other universities or anything like that. And we asked a lot more than, from them that we should have, and we ended up running the Alpha course. So what we did was, obviously we had set a date, we started to print flyers, we had branded water bottles, we printed out big banners, we printed out gazebos, we got shirts made, we, uh, we paid to have an interview done on Tux FM, we paid to post things on Tux social media, inviting students to our alpha course, and we, and we caught them with a the tagline, there will be free food, right? And so that's how we got them, because we know that's a great strategy to get uh, young adults in Hatfield to anything. And so the alpha course happened, and now we, we had decided there was another aspect that we were going to explore around reaching people for Eastside Hatfield, or rather for this Alpha course. And it was that we would head out onto the streets. Now, lots of people, like just by that idea alone, lots of people get intimidated by that. Um, but we felt like Hatfield is this place where there are students walking through all the time. The place is pumping. The streets is a great place for us to find people that we had never reached or never met before and invite them into something. So we printed a lot of flyers. We printed water bottles where we had, uh, we, we put together a website for the Alpha course so that it would be easy for people to register. Uh, we printed these water bottles with Alpha branding, and we went out onto the streets in the hot summer day, and we invited students to this Alpha course. And we did that for a few times. We went out in large groups. And eventually the Alpha course happened. The day came, it arrived. We had food organized. We had a venue organized. We had, I think you'll see the, the photos up behind me. That We did that set up all on a roof. Uh, you'll see the photo to the left. Uh, the seats are empty because no one has arrived yet, but that's what the setup looked like. And then you can see, like right in the middle there, that is the roof packed out with 60 to 80 students that, that by the way, we had never necessarily met before other than a connection on the street and, and that's what it looked like. 
Now, from us going to have, going to have absolutely no ministry in Hatfield to a few weeks later launching an Alpha course like that, it's just incredible. Like, it is evident that God was present, God was with us, but, but, but the reality was we did this in the pandemic. Like, we did this where we had to actually still wear masks while we were having a discussion. But look at what God did at this Alpha course. And I always think back to this. This was a good couple of years ago, but, but what, I, what was so interesting for us is we couldn't believe that we had got all these students in one place, right? And it sounds like this is an advertising section for Eastside Hatfield. It's not. I promise there's a point to my story. But we wanted to be like, okay, well, we wanted to investigate. What was it that got these people to come here? Because I can be honest, like if I got invited to something on the street, you'd, have to, you'd almost have to pay me to go to it, right? Because I'm skeptical. I'd be like, there's something fishy. Why is the food free? Like, what, is, what are you guys trying to do? Like, this sounds weird, right? And we asked the guys, we're like, what is it that, what is it that made you come? And, and logically, you'd think to yourself, well, I mean, we, we did an interview on Tux FM, telling people about Alpha. We, we posted stuff on social media. We, we got the word out. We got people to, like, reach out to their friends on WhatsApp and things like that. And do you know, most of the people that we spoke to said, somebody intentionally connected me with me on the streets. And I was like, okay, I'm in. Most of that group that came on that evening that we decided to host the Alpha and continue to come was because someone decided to intentionally connect with them, a person that they had never known, never met, never seen, and they decided to come to the Alpha course. I'm not saying there isn't a place for branding and websites and all these other things, but, but those people filled that room because someone, or filled that, that rooftop because someone intentionally connected with them. Now, we run at least one Alpha course a year in Hatfield with about 50 to 70 students that come through. We have an Eastside Hatfield campus where we run services every single Sunday night. Last week, Sunday, we had 70 people. We are expecting a whole bunch more. Uh, we run student life groups where 40 to 60 young adult students come together to dig into the Word together. We have over five different simple groups running simultaneously throughout the year. Ultimate Frisbee, uh, simple running, simple tennis, simple squash. We have people that have been able to find a place to call home because of one intentional connection. Because one person decided to say, I'm going to intentionally step out and I'm going to reach out to someone else and I'm going to invite them in. That's why we have the Hatfield campus that we have today and we give all the credit to God. I do not know how we did this. We ended up not planning a church in a few weeks because that would have been crazy and then we started a coffee shop in five days. And, and, and that was just a whirlwind in and of itself. But there's, the point that I'm trying to make is there's an incredibly powerful thing behind just intentionally connecting with someone. And it has the capacity to absolutely change someone's life if we are willing to do it. And so this morning, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be digging into a, a passage of Scripture, John chapter 4, where Jesus actually models something for us of how we as a church, as a community of faith, can bring hope and salvation. That's why we exist as a church. Like, if anybody asks you, hey, like, why, why, why is your church your church? Like, why does it exist? Like, what do they do there? You can just tell them they exist to bring hope and salvation. If it's in youth ministry on a Sunday, they exist to bring hope to the teens and salvation to the teams. If it's a kids ministry on a Sunday, hope to the kids and salvation to the kids. If it's church on a Sunday, hope and salvation. If it's having events, hope and salvation. If it's having meetings, everything that we do leads to hope and salvation because we believe that is what God has called us to as a community of faith, especially here in Pretoria East. But what it looks like specifically for us each year looks a little bit different. And so we have a Vision Sunday where Rian, our senior pastor, he brings us a word. And that word for the year will be our practical passage as to what the hope and salvation looks like for our church for the next year. And it just so happens that the passage that Rion brought before us was John chapter 4, where Jesus has this incredible encounter with this woman at the well that leaves this woman and her village and for the rest of her life ultimately transformed. You see, Jesus understood just how to do these intentional connections. Jesus oriented himself, his life around connecting with people on an individual level and that led to some incredible life change and ultimately led to the world being changed forever. And so the reason that we're going into John chapter 4 is because that is our vision passage for the year. And, and I, I think that it's an incredibly powerful pax, passage for us as a church to really ask ourselves the question, how do I bring hope and salvation? 
Because we can have these events on a Sunday. We can have all the Alpha courses that we need to. We can have the events. We can have the life groups. We can have the incredible church services. But until we as a church on an individual level decide to say, I exist in my 9 to 5 and my Monday to Saturday and every other hour of the week that I have because my church exists to bring hope and salvation, I am my church. I exist to bring hope and salvation. We have to ask ourselves, what does that look like practically? And we believe that Jesus gives us some incredible insights. And so for the next five weeks, we'll be dealing with that. And the first topic that I'm going to be dealing with is connecting. I thought it'd be good to jog your memory a little bit as to what Rian did say around uh, the vision for Eastside for 2024. So I've edited a bit of his message. It's not long, but I want to ask you to take a look at the screen as we watch it together. Now, what is our vision statement? Our vision statement is we bring hope and salvation. Simple as that. And what that means is we talk about Jesus, we do everything in our power to to help people hear the message. But this story goes a little bit further. The disciples were there, they were on a mission for God, they were going to talk about hope and salvation and so on, but they missed the woman at the well. And Jesus models something. And so today, um, I I want to mobilize you, not to just get into God's presence, but... I'm trusting God to ignite something in your spirit that will help people in the village called Pretoria to come and see for themselves. When we started Eastside, we dreamt about the women at the well. We said we wanted to be a church for the unchurched, people who don't go to church. I mean, if someone goes to Methodist church, it's a good church. Choose lies up the road. It's a great church. I mean, I'm mates with John. Um, all of that is true. But every day, every one of us come into contact with someone who's not in church, the woman at the well. And my prayer for you is that you would so pursue God that you would become sensitized to the woman at the well. Um, And as I've said, it starts with a heart. Um, And then, here's what my prayer is for you, um, that you yourself won't just experience God, but that you would experience a, I've got to go and tell the woman at the well about the love of God moment. But all of our lives, Debbie and I have given ourselves to find the woman at the well. We felt it in our spirits. And I think it was two days before Debbie died, we had a devotional time together, and, and we prayed. We prayed for our church. We prayed that God would turn us into a church that will notice the woman at the well. And so I want to ask that we change our vision statement just a little bit. It must say, we bring hope and salvation. How can we do that if we haven't experienced for ourselves? And the, so in God's presence, to have that God, those God moments, will you pursue that? And then the third thing is, I want, I want you, before you wake up every morning to pray this prayer, God, Who is the woman at the well today? Who is that one person? Who do you want me to bring hope and salvation to? So it's it's really helpful for us to think about that and to ask the question, who is it that God wants us as a community to bring hope and salvation to in our day-to-day, in the every moments that we have? And I think that's a really good question to ask, as Rian has said, like as we wake up in the morning, God, who is it? that you will put in my path that we can bring hope and salvation to. But also, we need to ask ourselves the question, how do we do that? You see, our lives are filled with these opportunities of intentional connections. The people that you interact with, the people that you engage with on a day-to-day basis, the, the people that fill up your car with fuel, the security guards that are at your complex, the people that you stand in an elevator with, the people that you buy food from at the shops, right? Our, la- our lives are filled with these little interactions, and so we have to ask ourselves, how do we do this? If, how do we intentionally live like Jesus lived in those everyday moments to connect with the people that God so desperately wants us to connect with? So what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to John chapter 4, because I believe that it will answer that question as we think about the first topic of all five, which is that, that initial stage of just connecting intentionally with people. And so what I've asked is, I've asked Sarah to come up and read John chapter 4 for us. And so we'll listen to the word together. I'm going to tell you three things that I think is important for us to understand. I'm going to tell you how I think you can do it. And that's it. All right, Sarah, can you come up? Can we give Sarah a round of applause? 
Okay, John chapter 4, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to a Samaritan village of Shychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at that time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. So the woman said, you, you must be a prophet, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews." But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and for finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and the other harvests. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. We, now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. So that's, a, that's the incredible, incredibly powerful story of 
uh, John chapter 4, where we find Jesus encountering this one woman at the well and everything else changes for her. Now, I really believe that this passage holds an incredible amount of significance just around what it looks like practically for us to live out our lives. Uh, and as we ask ourselves that question that Rian said, you know, uh, that Rian challenged everybody to ask, God, who is that woman at the well today that you are wanting us to reach out to? And so there's a couple of things that I think Jesus did very intentionally around connecting with people. And I'd like to bring your attention to that this morning in the hope that it might give you something practical to do in the week that lies ahead. The first thing I want you to notice is Jesus didn't connect with this woman at a synagogue. Say it again. Jesus didn't connect with a woman at a synagogue. Verse 3 to 5. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to a Samaritan village called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jesus was traveling back from Galilee and decided to go through Samaria on the way. Now, what we find about this journey that Jesus was going through is he encountered the woman at the well, not at a place of worship. In fact, Jesus encountered the woman at the well in one of his day-to-day things that he had to do. Jesus didn't wait for life group on a Tuesday night to encounter the woman at the well. He didn't wait for church on a Sunday, although Jesus did do a lot of connecting in religious places of worship. But what we find is that Jesus intentionally connected with a woman on one of his day-to-day journeys where he was going back to Galilee. Jesus had his life orientated around reaching out to people, and Jesus connected with this woman in one of his day-to-day tasks. When there were crowds, Jesus made a connection point for so many different people. Jesus was interested in connecting with so many different people in different crowds all the time because that was the way that he lived. It was an everyday moment. Now, people traveled far, and Jesus was traveling, and this was on this journey, and Jesus decided that it doesn't matter what happens, Jesus will connect with someone, and he will bring about the kingdom in their lives. It was in his everyday comings and goings that Jesus decided to reach out to people even when it was difficult, even when it wasn't easy. And so we find Jesus connecting with this woman at the well. Now, as you, as you think about Jesus connecting with someone in his day-to-day, in his everyday comings and goings, I want you to ask yourself this question. Where in your life is there an opportunity for you to connect with people? Where in your life is there an opportunity for you to connect with someone in your day-to-day? The second thing I want you to notice is Jesus connected with her about something relevant. Verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now, when Jesus connected with this woman, he connected with her on something that was very relevant to the situation that they were in. Jesus didn't ask her for food. He was hungry, but the disciples were out to get food. Jesus didn't speak to her about faith necessarily as he connected with her, as he started out the conversation. He didn't connect with her around church and what her views are, but he asked her something that was relevant. She was going to get water, and Jesus found an opportunity there to reach out to her and say, please may I have something to drink? You know, there were a whole bunch of reasons, and we see from her response and the way that Jesus spoke to her, there were a few reasons as to why Jesus should have ignored her. There were a few reasons as to why Jesus, from a cultural perspective, it wouldn't have been appropriate for Jesus to actually ask her for some water. But what does Jesus do? He asks her for something that everybody needs to, he needs to survive. Jesus asks her for some water. And so Jesus reaches out to her on something that is incredibly relevant, especially in the situation. Jesus started a conversation with her with something that wasn't weird, it wasn't strange, but it was a simple request for him to have some water. And so as you think about that, I want you to think about your everyday moments in your life. Where are there opportunities? And ask yourself this question. Where are there opportunities in your life for you to, for you to connect with people on something that's relevant? Something that's in your day-to-day, something that is easy for you to reach out to people. The third thing I want you to notice is Jesus had every reason not to connect with this lady. Every reason. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now, this is where the story gets really interesting because Jesus actually had every reason to not reach out to this woman. Number one, from a cultural perspective, Jews and Samaritans did not connect with each other at all. There was, there was a whole bunch of like discrimination against different groups, and so this was something that was just not okay from a Jewish perspective to connect with a Samaritan woman. But on another level, this woman was a lady who had a reputation. 
And so for Jesus to take it a step further, he also shouldn't have connected with her because she had the reputation that she did and also because of what it would have looked like. On another level, Jesus should not have connected with this woman because Jesus was a man and she was a woman and they were both alone and that would have been considered to be inappropriate. On another level, Jesus was hungry, thirsty, and tired. And what do we find Jesus doing? He still reaches out to her and he still connects with her. Like if anybody had any reason to not, know what Je- to not reach out to someone, it was Jesus. And what do we find Jesus doing? His life is oriented around connecting and reaching people for the kingdom of God. Anybody, uh, anybody join us for the fasting journey that we've just done? How many of you know uh, it was hard for you to be a nice person when you were hungry, right? How many of you know that it wasn't easy to be kind and to be nice and, and to do all the things that you still had to do when you weren't eating? Imagine being hungry, thirsty, traveling in the hot sun. How many of you want to meet new people when you're in that space? Definitely not me. What do we find Jesus doing? reaching out to someone that he shouldn't connect with and absolutely changing her life forever because he stayed faithful and because he decided to do that in a way that was very practical. This wasn't a comfortable connection for Jesus, and this is something that we need to remember. And I think sometimes, especially in modern-day Christianity, we tend to think that if it's not comfortable, it's not from God. I think sometimes it's the complete opposite. God does call us sometimes into uncomfortable positions because he wants us to trust him. And so this wasn't, an, this wasn't a comfortable connection for Jesus, but we find Jesus doing it, and we know exactly what happens in the story. And so a good reflecting question as you think about your day-to-day, and you think about the people that you walk past, and you think about the people that we naturally ignore because it's just it's the world that we live in. What are your reasons or what are your excuses for not reaching out to the people around you? I think it's good to start there and to ask ourselves that question because it's good for us to confront those things and be like, why is it that I don't connect with people in the way that I should? Or why is it that I'm not reaching out to people like that? Or why did I just ignore that person? Often if you find a reason, that's a good starting point because then you can be like, okay, cool, well, God is challenging me out of this. And so I think that's a good question to ask. You see, I think Jesus in the story was showing us very practically what it looked like for us as a church to bring hope and salvation. And now we know exactly where to start. It's in an everyday connection. It's in an everyday connection, reaching out to the people that are around us. And Jesus is showing us here that actually there are opportunities that are everywhere. Now, we don't need to overcomplicate any of this. Jesus started one person at a time. And that's how Jesus functioned, and that's how he lived. And so Jesus actually modeled in John chapter 4 what it looks like for us to start bringing hope and salvation to our community, our city, our country, and our world. And so how we connect with people matters. And so what I've done... um, in my message now is I'm going to try to make this as practical as possible um, because I think that if it's easy to do, we know exactly where we can start. So I want to ask um, everybody to pick up the piece of paper that is on your chair. If you don't, want to have, if you don't have one on your chair, just grab one in front of you. Um, it's a piece of paper that looks just like this. You'll see there's five circles over there. Connect, invest, invite, shape, disciple, and me is you. And then on the back, what you will see is you'll see that there's a block with a whole bunch of like little squiggly lines. And this is a space where I want to ask you to start to do some reflecting, right? So we're going to have a moment in the service where I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Um, and so I'm going to ask JP to come up and he's going to play over you. But here's where, here's where I want you to start. I want you to start right at the back over here. And I want you to start asking yourself some questions about your own life. Now, you can think about your day-to-day. You can think about your comings and your goings. You can think about your world right now. And I want you to ask yourself a few questions as you look at it. First question, and I'll have the questions up behind me afterwards. Uh, First question, where in my life is there an opportunity for me to connect with someone? This could be people that you know. It could be at work. It could even be at church. It could be when you go shopping. It could be anybody that you encounter. Dropping the kids off at school, whatever this looks like. Where in your life are there opportunities for you to reach out and for you to just connect with someone? And sometimes connecting can be as simple as just saying hi, learning someone's name, complimenting someone, anything like that. But uh, you can think about that for yourself. The second thing I want you to ask yourself is what, where, what are your everyday moments that you could, cho- that you could turn into opportunities of connection? Like, where are there areas in your life? God has given every single one of us, we look different, we sound different, we work in different spaces. God has given every single one of us different spheres of influence that God has allowed us to have so that when we reach out to someone in a certain way, 
God uses that in an incredibly powerful way for his kingdom. So what are your everyday moments that you could turn into opportunities for connection? And the last question I want you to ask yourself is, what are the reasons or excuses that you tell yourself as to why you shouldn't be connecting with people or why you can't be connecting with people right where you're at? I think sometimes people would so desperately want to go and reach everybody out there and in other countries, and I think that's an incredible place for us to be. And I think God calls people specifically to that, but I also think that sometimes it's best for us to just reach the people around us. If we can start there, that's a really good place to start. And so, third step, I want to ask you to write the names down. So, uh, Robs has said that she will send us out on the news groups, so you will have a digital version as well. If you're online, you will have a version as well. But I want to ask you right now, JP's going to come up and he's going to play over us. I want you to think about some names. I want, to, I want you to ask God for some names that he can give you, and I want to ask you to write them down on this piece of paper, because this is fundamental to the next few steps of the series that we're going to be doing for the next five weeks. And then what I want to ask you to do after that is I want to ask you to do it. If you write down the names and if you've had your moments of reflections, you now have the names and you have a space where you can refer to and you have something to hold yourself accountable to, you could write down the place where I fill up fuel. I'm going to go to the same place and I'm going to make sure that I can connect with that person who's filling up my car. You could be like, I'm going to go to the shops and I go to a specific Woolies or I go to a specific pick and pay or spa or whatever. I'm going to connect with those people there. Or it could be your security guard at your complex. You might be someone that drives a lot and so you need to fill up a lot. Fill up in the same place so that you can reach out to the person there. You might have been introduced to a friend of a friend and so the, the connection's already been made. All you need to do is solidify it. Might be you dropping kids off at school and you have to wait for your kids and there's a group of parents that wait together. You can reach out to them and you can connect with them and just introduce yourself. Say hi, smile, learn their names. Wherever it is, it shows I really, I really believe that God is wanting to do something incredible in and through our church. And he's wanting to do something incredible through you. And when you think about this, I want you to know that you must say to yourself, God is wanting to do something incredible through me. Not the pastor, through me. Because that's who Eastside is. And so JP's going to play for a little bit. You have the piece of paper in front of you. You can fill out the names. I'm going to give you a chance to do this. And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to close the service. Okay, so you got your piece of paper, you've written down your names. I have some I have some names, church, that I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit nervous to connect with them. Yeah? Anybody feel that way? I think that's the point. I think that Jesus is always calling us out of this place that we're in into a space where he can truly use us. And when we're nervous and when we're not sure that we have the courage for it, welcome to being human. But I think it's really powerful because then when we're in that space, we can say, God, give me strength. I know some of you put down a name of a family member that you don't really feel like connecting with. I know that. 
But I believe that if we take this first step, God can transform our city. If you had looked at that Samaritan woman, knowing how the story ends, if you had looked at her and thought to yourself, through this woman, an entire village will be transformed. Someone had told me that I wouldn't have believed it. But that intentional connection, can you imagine what Pretoria East can look like if each of us just have our people that we are connecting with? And so the connecting is really important because that is the first step. I know that there's a lot more in the process of of telling people about Jesus and just connecting with them. But I think connecting is a really easy, really like low key, low play, low pace way to start. So as we journey through the series, we will be looking at a whole bunch of different areas. So it'll be connecting, then investing, inviting, sharing, and discipling. And so when we look at these different aspects of the sermon series, the first step is for you to go reach out and connect with someone. And so I'm going to ask you to keep this piece of paper. If it's digital, then keep your digital notes on your phone. We're going to work off of it for the next five weeks, and we are going to journey together as a church to bring hope and salvation. I really believe that God is going to do something incredible through our church. And I've seen so many of you be so faithful with us. And I want to challenge you this morning. If you've never done it before, start this week. The only reason, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before I pray for you, the only reason that I can stand up here today and and tell you about Jesus and tell you about how incredibly transformational and powerful his mission is, is because someone probably sat in church one day, felt a little bit uncomfortable and thought about me and thought that they would, hey man, I'm going to connect with that person. Imagine your kids, imagine your family members, imagine your co-workers. As you sit here right now, God can do the impossible if we are faithful to just make ourselves available for it. And so connecting is the first step. I want to invite you to join us next week as well um, to, to, to really dig into the series. Uh, the next step on this will be what we'll be speaking about next week. And so I really hope to see you next week as we do this journey together um, as a church. One intentional connection from Jesus really can lead to something incredible happening. Can I pray for you? Jesus, we see in Acts chapter 2 how when the church actually just stepped out, something wonderful happened. Jesus, we've seen in history how when revivals broke out, it was just the church being who you have called them to be, sustained by you, guided by you, loved by you, empowered by you. Jesus, we know right now that all over the world, the global church is gathering together with their hearts ignited for the gospel of Jesus, so desperate to bring hope and salvation into their world. You know, Jesus, I know that there are churches out there that would love to be able to walk into the streets and bring hope and salvation, but they can't because they'd probably be persecuted for it. We have that freedom, Jesus, so will you set us alive with what it is that you call us to? For our city, for our families, we make, ourselves, we make ourselves available for you, King Jesus. And we pray that we would model our lives, bringing hope and salvation in this encounter that you had with the woman at the well. Rabbi, would we learn from you? Would we sit under your teachings? Would we take notice of your ways? Would we do it in our lives? Holy Spirit, I want to pray for the people here this morning. They're a little bit nervous, a little bit unsure about what the future holds with them reaching out and connecting. I pray, Jesus, that you would give them courage, that you would give them strength, and Holy Spirit, you would let them know who's with them, the God of heaven and earth. We love you, Jesus. We're grateful for your grace. Help us to be faithful. In your name, Lord Jesus, we ask and pray. And everybody said, hallelujah, amen. Church, thank you so much for coming today. I'm glad that you decided to come to church. Please do not rush off. We have our Connect Cafe open. We've got some good coffee for sale all of that kind of stuff. And then I know Rob said it again, uh, but I'm going to say it even again. We have our Hatfield launch tonight. Um, We really believe that God is doing something incredible in Hatfield. We cannot take the credit for it. It's too good for it to be us. It is really God. And so we want to ask, if you can't make it tonight, pray for us. But if you can make it tonight, it's not just a church for young people. It is a church for everybody, right? We are standing on your shoulders as we do ministry in Hatfield. So please pray for us. And if you can make it, Come celebrate with us as we kickstart the Hatfield campus. Guys, have a great Sunday. I'll see you again soon. Bye.